All right, you can turn in your Bible to Revelation chapter 6. Continuing the study, the expository study for Bible-believing Christians. Again, if you're new to these studies, if you're just tuning in for the first time, um, these studies are not to dissect all the intricate details, the doctrine of what exactly is going to happen and everything else. Um, I, as a Bible-believing preacher, a dispensational preacher, teach that these events are going to be for the people, the saints in the time of Jacob's trouble. I have a lot of studies proving that. And um, so, but as a Christian today, I can look and I can apply what goes on in the book of Revelation for instruction and righteousness, you know, uh, for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. I can apply these things and say, what can we learn today as Christians? What challenges can we find from the book of Revelation? That's the point of doing these studies. Again, I'm not going to get into a lot of the details of what exactly each thing means. But the got some interesting things to show you today in Revelation chapter 6. So let's begin Revelation chapter 6 verse 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. Okay? Now, first interesting point to point out here. Notice it does not say when the Lamb opened the first seal. And that, that's what most people think. They think, well, he opened the first seal. It doesn't say that. It says one of the seals. And what's going to happen is when you start to study the book of Revelation, you're going to go, wait a second here. It says here that this particular judgment happens, but over in this other chapter, you have a trumpet being blown. It's the same. It looks like the same judgment. See? Why? Because the book of Revelation is not chronological. It's not... Chapter 6 happens, then chapter 7, then chapter 8, and the whole way through to, you know, the end. Uh-uh, no. There's some of it is chronological. Obviously, the last part, last book of the book of Revelation, last chapter, excuse me, of the book of Revelation um, is at the end. Okay, and you go back to chapter 1, and that's, at, you know, before chapter, you know, 22. Okay, so there is some chronology there. But as far as the time of Jacob's trouble... What's going on in the book of Revelation is you have retellings and, and chapter 6 in particular is the whole time of Jacob's trouble, the whole seven-year period, the whole thing. I'm going to demonstrate that as we continue in this study. So the Lamb opens one of the seals. Now, I just said that just so you would see it, right? I'm not going to go into a big study on that whole thing, comparing the seals, the trumpets, the vials. There's a lot of overlay there, a lot of overlap. There are similar events that are happening. So that's point number one. Point number two, notice the very interesting wording there. Come and see. Okay, very interesting. Notice down in verse three, come and see. Verse five, come and see. Verse seven, come and see. Four times the word come and see is there. Now think about that for a minute. Can the body of Christ right now see what's going to happen in the time of Jacob's trouble? I mean, actually see it visually happening. No. Where would we have to go to see that happening? Up to be with the Lord. So what does the Lord say in Revelation chapter 4? Come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Come and see. Who is being called, who is being told this right here in Revelation chapter 6? John. Is John saved? Yes. The disciple whom Jesus loved. Does Jesus love the church? See? Ephesians chapter 5. Yes, Jesus does love the church. So we see here a very interesting little reference to the rapture. Again, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Come and see. It is not possible for the body of Christ to come and see if we're down on the earth. Right? And again, if you believe anything but a what they call pre-trib rapture, it's not actually the biblical term for it, but let's just go with that. If you believe anything but that, you've been led into heresy. Simple. And I have hundreds of hours of studies on this subject. So don't even tell me I don't know what I'm talking about or preaching Jesuit futurism or some kind of nonsense like that. All right, but I'll show you a little interesting tie in here. Philippians, you can keep your hand there in Revelation chapter 6, but turn over to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. 
show you a couple interesting verses here. Beginning in verse 21, Philippians 1.21 says, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Very true if you're a Christian. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Amen. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Every Christian is better off going to be with the Lord. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, it's, it's nice to stay here and you get more rewards and things that will show up at the judgment seat of Christ if you're living right. If you're doing wrong, then you're going to see more of your life burned up at the judgment seat. Yeah, it's nice. Thank you. You know, I appreciate the Lord when, you know, and, and you thank Him when He uses you for His service. Great. Wonderful. But uh, there's times it gets a little vexing. And you just think to yourself, if I could just go home to be with the Lord... <laughs> Well, if the Lord gave me the option, you know, I'd be like, okay, yeah, let's go, you know. But you know what? It's more needful for the other people out there, for the lost world. It's more needful for us as Christians to be here for the lost world. Why? Well, because he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. We are actually the, the one thing that's keeping back the Antichrist from showing up. And when we leave, when the body of Christ leaves, he can show up. But we are here to hinder the forces of Satan. You know, they come out and they say, hey, uh, let's, let's have sodomite marriage. Bible-believing Christians say, uh, actually, that's an abomination. Hey, why don't we let transgendered perverts, you know, people with mental disorders, use whatever restroom they want to use? Oh, there's a little girl just went into that bathroom, and this guy thinks he's a woman, so he can go in and use the same bathroom. No, no, no. Bible-believing Christians protest. And we say, that's wrong. The Pope comes out and he says, you can't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It has to be through Christ's church. Liar. I can show you from the Scriptures. You see, there is no Catholic church in the, in the King James Bible, or any Bible actually for that matter. There's no mention of Catholicism. There's no mention of sacraments. There's no mention of the Eucharist or transubstantiation or nuns or monks or whatever or the Immaculate Conception of Mary, or whatever else. See, we are here to withhold the evil. I'll tell you right now, the only reason America, and the UK, and Australia, and Germany, and a lot of the other countries, Canada, the only reason that they haven't totally descended into utter chaos is because there's still Bible-believing Christians around. That's the only reason. It isn't science or some other kind of nonsense that is keeping back, you know, bad things. Science has been used to build nuclear bombs, as well as all kinds of other weapons that are going to be used to slaughter, you know, untold millions of people, which we'll be getting into here in just a little bit. You see, we're supposed to be here, and there's another reason we're supposed to be here. Notice it says there, verse 24, Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you, saved people. Yes, we're supposed to be here for lost people. That's true. We are the witness. We are the light of the world. Our light comes from Jesus Christ. We're, you know, there's another good analogy. Jesus is like the sun, and the church is like the moon. The moon does not have any light of its own. It does not produce light on its own by itself. It reflects the light of the sun. Okay? And it shines during the night. Right now, we're, it's like nighttime. And when Jesus Christ comes back for the millennial kingdom, it will be the day of the Lord. A thousand years is as one day. Interesting tie-ins there. But we are supposed to be here also for each other. I mean, some people, well, I'll get it, I'm not going to get ahead of myself here. Um, would it be an encouragement for you if I was gone? If something happened to myself and my wife and we were no longer online? Some people are probably screaming and yelling, yes, that'd be wonderful. <laughs> be rid of the heretic and whatever. You know, well... You got your own issues, but uh, for some of you out there that, that uh, love us and we love you, um, our brothers and sisters in Christ, it'd be rough. You know, you'd be, you know, if we died of natural causes or something like that, or even if we were martyred, you'd say, well, you know, they're, they're with the Lord, absent from the body, present with the Lord. But you'd think about it and you'd think to yourself, man, he's not there anymore. We don't see any more videos coming out. His wife isn't in the videos with him. Boy, I sure miss him. You know, uh, Dr. Ruckman, 
whatever you want to say about him, oh, yeah, people back and forth, whatever, whatever, you know, I get kind of tired of that. Uh, I'm glad he's with the Lord. Sure, sure. But uh, that man meant a lot to me. I didn't agree with everything that he said. Good night, people. Well, you know, give me a break here. I'm not some kind of cult follower of Ruckman's, but uh, he's a great man. Meant a lot to me. I read a lot of his material, listened to a lot of, a lot of his preaching, watched a lot of his sermons and things. Uh, he changed my life. The Lord used him mightily in my life. Um, it was sad when I heard that he passed and went home to be with the Lord. You know, and, and, uh, but I'm glad. I'm glad he's gone. But he was a great encouragement to me. Uh, he kept me from getting messed up. I was really headed down some dark alleys, so to speak, when I uh, was getting into some of the research I was years and years ago. And um, Ruckman brought me back from the precipice <laughs> of false doctrine. Uh, God gave him a great ability to teach. And uh, you can take it or leave it. I really could care less what you think of the man. But uh, verse 25, let's continue. We're here for each other, in other words. Uh, verse 25, And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. Joy of faith. Yeah, you get to see it. That your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you. Hmm. Come and see. Or else be absent. I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Can we see Paul physically right now? No. Could the Philippians back then? Well, when he was there, yeah. Sure, absolutely. He, but he had to come and see them. But when he was writing, he was absent from them. You know what? Right now we are absent from Paul, as well as all the other characters in our Bible. We're absent from them. We can't see them. But you know something? Someday the body of Paul, wherever it's buried, if there's even anything left of it, that body is going to come up. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. We're going to come and we're going to see the events of Revelation chapter 6. You can go back there. And it's going to be a glorious day. I mean, to be there and witnessing all this stuff that the Lord is doing to this earth because they've rejected Jesus Christ and just mocked Him and put Him down and everything else. And the Lord is just saying, okay, you people want proof that I exist? I gave you my Son I let him die on the cross to pay for your sins, but you need to see more. You're not convinced. You can't look at nature and say, wow, there must be, what an amazing creation, there must be a creator. You can look at books, you can look at computers, you can look at uh, automobiles, houses, whatever, and say, oh yeah, there's, somebody made this. But you can look at nature and say it made itself accidentally at some undetermined time in the past. Uh, you know, no, it was God. Oh, I need to see more proof. They're going to see it. And we will be in heaven with the Lord saying, come and see, gather around. We're going to look down. Whoa, <laughs> I'm glad we got out of there. Verse 2. And I saw and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now, right here in my Cambridge King James Bible, in the center column, you have the center column references. Some of you, it might be over to the side, maybe down at the bottom of the page, or maybe even behind the verse. You know, sometimes the King James Bibles will have that. And it says here, chapter 6, you know, and you look at the little number 2 there, and it says, Zechariah 6.3, chapter 19, verse 11. Okay. It's talking about, there's no chapter 19 in Zechariah. It's talking about this book, the book of Revelation, chapter 19 and verse 11. So let's go back there. 19 verse 11. And it says here, chapter 19 verse 11 in Revelation, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. 
His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Capital W there. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his name, a, on, excuse me, and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. All right? I mean, is there any doubt as to who this is? You read the rest of, rest of the context of chapter 19 there, it's cl clearly speaking about Jesus Christ. All right? So you have Jesus Christ in chapter 19, but why does chapter 6 refer over to chapter 19? See, you will say, well, they're the same. I, I, you know, I've actually heard that. People say, well, it's the same. It's the same writer. So Jesus comes, comes back when the first seal is open. Excuse me, when one of the seals is open. See, I did it there. <laughs> when one of the seals is open, Jesus Christ comes back. Mm -mm. Look, at the, look at the context here. Compare the two. Uh, chapter 6, verse 2. He that sat on him had a bow. Revelation chapter 19. Uh, let's see here. Verse 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. The rider in Revelation chapter 19 does not have a bow. He has a sword coming out of his mouth. Revelation chapter 6 verse 2. And a crown was given unto him. A crown. Verse 12 of night, chapter 19. On his head were many crowns. What do we have? The rider in Revelation chapter 6 verse 2 is a satanic counterfeit of Jesus Christ. I mean, back in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 when it says, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth. What is one of the titles of Jesus Christ? Jesus saith unto them, John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth. Do you understand that? God will send them strong delusion that they all might be damned who believe not the truth. You know what the average Christian worships, professing Christian? You know what, who, who they're worshiping already in the church buildings out there? They're worshiping the Antichrist. He doesn't judge people. He's effeminate. He is going to bring in world peace when he shows up. He's okay with everybody and he's tolerant and everything else. They're worshiping the Antichrist already. The only thing that they need to do is get rid of us narrow-minded, bigoted uh, Bible thumpers, which is exactly what they want, by the way, too. I mean, you say, oh, I don't know. Come on, Brian. Come on. You're just, you're just so negative. He's so negative. <laughs> you know, okay. Carry a King James Bible in to any church building out there. All right. Go in there and start saying, I believe the King James Bible is God's perfect word. The others are all satanic from the Vatican. Oh, by the way, while we're on the subject of the Vatican, it's, you know, Mystery Babylon in Revelation 17 and 18. It's going to be destroyed. And you're probably not going to get much else out other than that. And they're going to be like, oh, oh. We'd like to ask you to leave. Okay, you're causing problems here. You're causing dissension. You're div you're divisive, and you're you... uh huh. They want us to leave, and that's exactly what's going to happen. And when we leave, then their Christ is going to show up. It all ties together, brethren. Absolutely, it's amazing. Let's continue. Verse three. Revelation chapter 6, verse 3. And when he had opened the second seal, it is called the second now, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Every Pauline epistles, every, excuse me, every Pauline epistle, <laughs> they all start and end with peace. From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You get peace from God the Father. But uh, verse 4 says that it's taken from the earth. And the Lord's taken it. So now how does that work? 
Christians, the body of Christ, I wish it were true that we were going to be pre-trib raptured. I wish it was true, but we're going to be here for it. You might as well just get ready for it. Okay, let's get ready for it. Um, hey, son, I'd like you to sit down. Um, i got to tell you about God, about his character. Um, he's going to be taking peace from the earth soon, even though Paul wrote to us that we have peace through the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father. But God the Father, you know, in the person of Jesus Christ, is going to be taking peace from the earth very soon. Because you see, the whole scripture, everything in the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, it's all pointed doctrinally at us today as Christians. Remember, son, that dispensationalism is heresy. I know the word dispensational is four times in the King James Bible. It appears four times, and it's clearly taught, and you know, we're to rightly divide the word of truth. We're actually commanded, but it's heresy. It's been created by the Jesuits. and <laughs> Yeah. Nutball. Okay? And, and as I've said in other studies, there are some areas where, as Christians, we can agree to disagree, you know, the whole thing. Diet, holidays, um, the thing of head coverings, um, there's some, you can debate that back and forth, okay? Head coverings meaning if it's, if it's just kind of a cultural thing and whatever else, uh, okay, whatever. I know the Jews, you know, a lot of the Orthodox Jews and things, they have a thing with women wearing things over top of their hair, you know, and it's their hair is only for their husband to see and Fine, whatever. Uh, there's other cultures that, that women wear head coverings. Not a big issue. If they're wearing them because it's some kind of a spiritual thing uh, that they have to have it, it's, a, it's their spiritual protection. Eh, you're getting into some stuff there. But um, those are the three areas that a Christian in the New Testament can argue on or agree to disagree. I'll say it that way. Um, but doctrine, like dispensational teaching and things, no. There's no leeway there. You can't say, well, I'm a Christian and, and I believe dispensationally and I have a good friend who's a Christian and he believes the whole Bible's for him. No, you can't do that. You can't do that. Um, somebody that believes that way, if they're newly saved and they're deceived and whatever else, okay. Uh, I would not judge that person's salvation. Uh, they can get straightened out. Uh, God can help you with your ignorance. But if you get somebody that has studied the issue and they vehemently oppose dispensational teaching and it's the whole Bible's for me, I hate dispensational teaching. You're dealing with a spirit of pride there and Satan is the king of all the children of pride. They're not serving the Lord. Okay, You can't go through this book and compare scripture with scripture and say, oh, it's all for us. You can't do that. All right? Just as plain as day. All right, so, but let's continue. Verse 5 and 6 here, we'll read those. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and, a, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Okay, now, I got to kick something here, kind of a little pet peeve of mine. Um, the Bible talks in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20, about beware of opposite, oppositions of science falsely so called. And I'm going to tell you, I am very much into natural health. I'm into all that stuff. Uh, I study it more and more as time goes by because I like to feel good. You know, I don't like to be sick all the time. I believe in the, the you know, food is your medicine. I believe that is a very good uh, thing to keep in mind. Um, I believe that you should, you know, do your very best to eat well, take care of the body that God's given you so that you can stay in ministry and all of that. But there is a very, very dangerous movement within the natural health thing, and that is uh, they don't practice moderation. You have somebody that says uh, sugar of any kind is bad, no matter what, for any reason and whatever. Well, what kind of sugar are we talking about here? Are we talking about pure, natural, raw cane sugar? Or are we talking about processed white sugar? Well, sugar, sugar on... Uh, no. Uh, milk is bad for you. Milk is terrible. Milk, we were never meant to eat or drink milk. You know, milk products are evil. They're of the devil. What kind of milk are we talking about? Are we talking about pasteurized, homogenized milk that you get from the store that's been chemically treated and they, they have to pump, you know, synthetic... 
uh, vitamins into the thing? Or are we talking about raw, grass-fed, you know, whole milk? What are we talking about here? See? And I'll tell you another one. Wheat. Oh, we got to have gluten-free diet. Oh, gluten-free diet. Wheat is evil. You got to get gluten completely out of your diet. Eh, hold on there. Again, see, we're going back to this whole thing. What kind of wheat are we talking about? Are we talking about GMO type of stuff? Are we talking about heirloom wheat that's grown correctly and organically and things? See, it's an issue. Um, I'm going to tell you right now, we use uh, King Arthur brand. There's a artisan uh, brand of flour that we get here locally. And uh, they sell it. It only comes in like 50 pound bags and stuff. And um, ironically... It is organically grown wheat and barley uh, mixed together. And uh, makes a very, very nice flour. It's really good. You can really bake a lot of nice stuff with it and everything. My wife is really, really good at baking. And we feel good on that stuff. And uh, our health is in good shape. Now, if we eat too much of it, can we feel somewhat tired and lethargic and things? Yeah. Moderation. You have to practice moderation. Uh, you can have issues if you're eating too much of anything, right? Um, you shouldn't eat too much of anything, okay? You should practice moderation. But if you take a lot of these health people and they, you know, they'll just like rip into wheat. I mean, wheat is bad. Wheat is horrible. Then why was the Lord Jesus Christ eating bread? Why did he recommend bread? Let me show you this, okay? And they say, oh, well, science is proven. You can, you can make science prove anything, brethren. You just get the right uh, research institutes to be funded by the right people, you know, and they can kind of, well, look at that. We found this study, and it proves such and such. Yeah, you sure did. And you get your nice government grants to do it, don't you? Or uh, grants from the pharmacopoeia. Oh, excuse me, I mean pharmaceutical industry. I didn't mean to call it pharmacopoeia, although they themselves call it that. It's kind of funny. Pharmacopoeia, if you don't understand what I'm saying there, is actually a Greek word. And uh, in your King James Bible, uh, excuse me, pharmakia is the Greek word. Pharmakia in your King James Bible is also is translated as witchcraft. No tie into the modern pharmaceutical uh, industry, of course. They don't mix together chemicals and come up with magic potions called pills. They would never think of doing a thing like that. But uh, Psalm, Psalm 104, Psalm 104, verse 14 and 15. Let's look at this. He causeth the grass to grow for the cattle and herb for the service of man. See herbal remedies there. That he may bring forth food out of the earth. Your food should come out of the earth, by the way. It should not be processed food from factories. You know, if, if there's a picture of your food on a box... Uh, you probably don't want to eat it, okay? It should be whole food, raw food is the best kind of a diet. Raw food, fruits, vegetables. Eat those raw, unless it's like a potato or something, you know. Don't eat that raw. It's a little crunchy. <laughs> but whole foods meaning um, non-processed, you know, things. I mean, that's, that's the best thing that you can do. Raw foods, of course, like I said, fruits and vegetables. Don't eat your meat raw. Important. But look at verse 15. And wine that maketh glad the heart of man, and oil to make his face to shine, and bread which strengtheneth man's heart. If you study what real true wheat bread is able to do, it I don't know that I didn't write down the different things it has in it, but it's packed with nutrition, really true nutrition. And uh, well, I can prove that wheat bread. Yes, you're talking about factory GMO produced, you know, factory farm type of stuff. You know, let's not even go there. We're talking heirloom, wheat, good organic type, you know, things here. And they say, well, still, I, I would have to disagree. I think that uh, wheat is bad. Well, then uh, <clears throat> what kind of bread would strengthen man's heart? Well, modern science, has proved, modern science hasn't proved anything. There have been studies that have been skewed to say bread is evil and bread is bad. And uh, somehow, you know, we can, or, you know, another thing that they'll do, they'll come up with all these other alternative flowers and things. You're not going to get the heart benefits that you get from wheat. And the Bible back in Revelation chapter 6 is talking about wheat and barley becoming, you know, there's some scarcity there and things like this. 
Um, meaning that the wheat and barley of today, that there's still good wheat and barley around. So don't tell me, oh, the ancient grains were okay, but the stuff today, then why is it mentioned in the future as a future reference? You see? You see the problems people get into? People, and, and they're very well-meaning people. I'm not saying anybody that's, that's against wheat is just a servant of the devil or something like that. They fall for some of this stuff. And they, they listen to some of these reports that come out and wheat's bad for you. You know, there's uh, two schools of thought on garlic. You know, the one is that garlic is just incredible. It's antibacterial. It's got all these other properties. And then the other school of thought is that actually garlic was once used to, to poison the people. And if you get garlic in your blood, you're going to die soon and stuff like this. I mean, it's just, you know, garlic is toxic. It's poisonous. They both can't be right. Okay. But again, they both have their own little studies that they can prove their point. Um, I'm going to stick with the Bible. My Bible says bread strengthens your heart. Herb for the servants of man. See? I'm going to stick with what the Bible says. When Jesus Christ was here on the earth, he ate bread and fish. All right? And again, you know, I know, I understand. Somebody's going to say, but Brother Brian, the fish, you know, the whole Fukushima nuclear radiation going on in the Pacific Ocean and, you know, the waterways are polluted. You know, they, you know, they put the calcium carbonate on the, on the roads in the wintertime. It rusts the living daylights out of the vehicles. And then what's, what happens to it in the spring? It runs off into the rivers, you know. Bigger lakes and things, they're running, you know, gas-powered boats, and the exhaust comes out of the propeller shaft. I used to put together boat motors. I used to build boats. I understand. You know, their mercury levels are, are bad. I know, I know. Things are in really bad shape right now. But again, you can still have some discernment here. You can still say, okay, I can find some wild stream someplace that's not completely polluted, that they keep motorized boats out of, that there's not a lot of runoff and whatever else. Eat the fish from there. Wild cult type of things. You know, use your common sense here. But uh, interesting there, the verse in Psalm. But uh, Jeremiah chapter 17, I'm going to show you kind of an interesting little prophetic thing here um, on the subject of the heart. And I have kind of a sneaking little suspicion that this is probably part of the reason why uh, there's so much emphasis on this thing of getting rid of wheat. Uh, because the Bible said bread strengthens your heart. Is there heart failure out there? Oh yeah. Here's a spiritual form of heart failure. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You know the Bible says back in Psalm 14. The fool hath said in his heart. Heart. Not his head. The fool says in his heart. You see? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The heart is where your emotions are centered. Right? And you can't, you know, let's, sci I mean, scientifically explain to me what love is. They can't. The emotions and things like that. Well, it's chemical reactions and processes. That's some little scientific, you know, nincompoop that doesn't really understand things. All right, you can intellectually understand a lot of stuff. I'll grant you that. But when it comes to certain emotions and feelings, you know, it's a common thing to say, you know, I feel it in my heart. They got that from the King James Bible. It's tough for the atheists, I know. But uh, your heart is desperately wicked. You say, well, that's for lost people. It's for lost and saved. <laughs> If you let your heart go and you start to go with your emotions and don't keep yourself grounded to the Word of God, you'll fall into all kinds of trouble, all kinds of problems. But it's especially true of lost people. Their heart is, is deceitful and desperately wicked. But let me show you another little interesting tie-in to the thing here. Luke chapter 21. So we see that bread is good for a man's heart. And Jeremiah says that the heart is deceitful. So you have all these people going around saying, you have to get gluten, all the wheat completely out of your diet. No gluten, no gluten. Gluten's bad. It's of the devil. It's bad stuff. So what's happening? Well, if we believe our Bibles instead of modern science, oppositions of science falsely so-called, modern science, depending on what study you look at, of course, they say wheat bread, wheat bread is bad for your heart. Bad for your health, I should say. Okay. 
Um, so take it out of your diet. Well, what's going to happen? Is your heart going to get stronger or weaker? Weaker. I'll show you an interesting little thing here. Luke chapter 21, verse 25. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hello, <laughs> hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Now, I don't know. I've, I think I've talked about this in different studies, um, but I actually have a heart condition. Many of you might not know that. Uh, mitral valve prolapse is what it's called. I've been, I was diagnosed with it when I was a boy. I would get these really serious pains in my heart. And I could barely breathe and it was just, it felt like I was having a heart attack. And my parents took me to specialists and things like this. And they said, yeah, he's got mitral valve prolapse. And, you know, I would, if I ever had dental work done, I had to take penicillin before I, you know, went for the dentist thing and, and whatever. And there was a, this little Indian doctor, little short guy, Dr. Singh, S-I-N-G-H, you know. And uh, I remember he examined me and he said, yes, you know, you have mitral valve prolapse, you know, he's a little high voice. And he, and he said, you must exercise. You have to exercise. That is the only way to, you. there is no cure for what you have. You must exercise. You must make your heart strong. Your heart is very weak right now, very, very weak. You must make your heart strong. And I've tried to do that. That's one of the reasons I got into logging. That's one of the reasons I work as hard as I can physically yet. Uh, there's a lot of times I could be just sitting around doing video and things and studying the Word of God, but I have to keep my heart strong. Why? Because my heart is weak. It has been ever since I was born. Um, again, I, I was very, very a very large baby, and uh, one of the doctors that examined my mother back when she was with child with me actually suggested abortion because he said that there's going to be complications with this child, and he was partly right. I was born with a weak heart. And so the solution is I have to strengthen my heart. My Bible says that I can do it by eating bread. Modern science says, oh, actually, it's bad for your health to eat bread. Now, who am I going to believe? So, well, Brother Brian, you can't go against modern science. Well, yes, I can. Because when modern science contradicts the Word of God, I'll go with what my Creator said. And I don't care what anybody thinks about that. But I find it ironic that so many people are saying, cut the gluten, cut the wheat out of your diet. It's actually leading people to have weak hearts. Isn't that interesting? So when these people are left behind, all of a sudden, they see everything falling to pieces and they go, oh, and they get scared and all of a sudden, heart attack. Their hearts will fail them for fear. Just had to put that little thing in there. <laughs> little little kick in there. I just find that very interesting. But let's go back to Revelation chapter 6. And again, brethren, find the very best that you can, that you can afford and things. I mean, that's one of the purposes of praying over your food is, you know, God can cleanse the food. And that doesn't mean you go out and eat candy bars or whatever else. I mean, in context, uh, there in Timothy, it's talking about, you know, um, God, you know, every creature of God is good, you know, nothing to be refused. If it be received with thanksgiving uh, and sanctified by the word of God in prayer. I'm not quoting it exactly, but you can look that up. And uh, the point is there that it's creatures that are good. It's talking about clean versus unclean animals. That's not in effect for today as Christians. You can eat any type of an animal does not mean that you can eat any kind of food, all right, that's in the grocery store. But I realize, you know, to go out and get everything organic, heirloom, blah, 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 grass-fed, pasture-raised, the whole deal, um, that's not always possible. So pray over your food every time that you eat. Uh, pray over it. It's very, very important. Because um, you, the, the likelihood of you eating something that's poisonous or toxic today is... Very, very, very high. But uh, let's continue. Verse 7 and 8, Revelation chapter 6. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death. And hell followed with him. 
And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Okay, now there are two ways to look at this one part. His name that sat on him was death and hell followed with him. Okay, two ways to look at that. Number one is that death is this fourth rider. Death is brought upon the earth and the people that are dying are going to hell. Hell follows death. In other words, now the second way, and this is kind of strange, I don't know, uh, this would be very weird, but the second way to look at this would be death comes and the inhabitants of hell follow. Zombie apocalypse. I mean, wouldn't that be weird? You say, well, you, you can't teach it. I, I know. Again, I'm not teaching doctrine, right? This isn't for Christians. We're not going to be here for that time. We're going to be up in heaven, and they're going to say, come and see, watch this. Then we'll know what, you know, really happens there. But I've, I've actually heard this taught, you know, and, it, it, and again, just as a theory, not doctrinally, just as a theory. I don't know. Could that be one of the reasons why people's hearts are failing them for fear? It always cracks me up, you know, Halloween time comes and you go driving down the road and you'll see these people like the Halloween fanatics and there's like skeletons coming up out of the ground and they're like zombie hands coming up out of the soil and stuff. And I'm thinking, man, if that was real, it'd scare you half to death. What on earth are you doing putting that stuff out there glorifying death? You don't want to see that. I mean, you think I want to see right now? I can't really think if there's a graveyard in the area here. I don't think there is in, right immediately immediately in the town, but you know, you go past some graveyard, you know, going down the road and you see all of a sudden you see the ground coming up and this half dead rotted corpse comes out and, you know, starts coming towards you. You want to see that? You know, really? <laughs> I mean, could that be the reason people's hearts are failing them for fear? You say, well, in context, it says about they're looking up and they're seeing the fearful signs that are coming and that's why, yeah, I know that. But, uh, there could be all kinds of stuff that's going to happen in that time. Very interesting. But uh, I want to show you another thing here. It says there in verse 8, Power is given unto, him, or unto them over the fourth part of the earth. Notice to it, by the way, it says them, death and hell. It's including death and hell. Like they're both you know, figures there. And they're going out and killing. Death and hell are doing the killing. Again, you know, maybe the inhabitants of hell. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to be here. <laughs> I won't be here. So, praise the Lord for that. But look at this. Fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. I find it very interesting as well, um, if you do the research into this, animal die-offs are just escalating like crazy. I just saw just last night, I was watching this prophecy update video thing, and uh, they were talking about giraffes. The number of giraffes is just just plummeting. They're going extinct. And I thought, isn't that interesting? All these animal, fish, you know, bird, all these things are just dying by the millions. Hmm. And so in that time of Jacob's trouble, the beasts of the earth are actually going to be attacking people. It's going to be the cause of some of the death, the fourth part of the earth. And uh, you say, well, you know, I don't know about all this stuff. It just sounds kind of funny. Well, I want you to think about this statement right there. The fourth part of the earth is killed. Just to put this in perspective, right now, currently, I just checked, it's like 7.4 something, something, something billion. We're just under 7.5 billion people on this earth. Just under it. That means if a quarter of that dies, I've written down here, one-fourth of seven and a half billion people would be one billion eight hundred and seventy five million. One billion eight hundred seventy five million. Just to put that in perspective, okay? North America, five hundred seventy nine million. South America, four hundred and twenty two and a half million. Europe, Germany, France, England, you know, European continent there is 743.1 million, Egypt 88.5 million, Australia 24 million, and that leaves another 18 million people that would get us to the number of 
million or one billion eight hundred seventy-five million. Okay. In other words, there'd be nobody in North America. All the people are dead. South America. All the people are dead. Europe, Egypt, and Australia, plus another 18 million people on top of that yet. Gone. One judgment. Let that sink in for a minute. Well, I'm just not ready to get saved. I just don't know, you know, I, I'd need to see some proof. I mean, if the rapture happened, okay, I'd see my proof and things. You want to be in that number? One in four. Think about that the next time you go to the grocery store. And you look in there and you say, well, there's a hundred people in here today. That means 25 of them are going to be dead. One in four. A thousand people here at this fair or outside here today or whatever else, 250 of them drop dead. That's quite significant. Uh, you might do well to get saved now when all it's going to get you is just mocked and made fun of by your friends and co-workers and atheists laugh at you and whatever else tell you that you're, you know, reading an outdated book and whatever. You know, and, and for the atheists out there, oh, that's so funny, ha, 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 laughing about it. Um, look at the way the political move, maneuvering is going right now. All these different countries, you know, Hey, look, we're going to send up some intercontinental ballistic missiles. We're testing them. Oh, look, we got nuclear submarines running off the co coast of your, the shores of your country. Hey, look at this weapon. Hey, look at that. We're going to wipe Israel off the map. Hey, we're going to do this. We're going to go to war with Russia. Hey, we're going to move our troops into there. Aleppo and Syria, we're just going to bomb that thing. And we're, you know, ISIS is going to do this. And we're going to... Is the possibility there for a, a fourth... A, a quarter of all people on earth to be destroyed? Yeah. Even if you remove the Bible from the equation. Even if you say, hey, just let's just take the Bible out of the picture. The possibility is right there. Man can do it without the help of God. We're heading into that time. The world, the body of Christ is leaving at some point in time. You might want to get saved. If you're not. Verse 9, Revelation chapter 6, verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. Notice it's a lowercase w. That's a written word of God. And for the testimony which they held. Notice the two different things there. They're slain for the written word and the testimony which they held. What's the testimony? That they're saved. They put their faith in Jesus Christ. So don't tell me, oh no, the word of God there is Jesus. That wouldn't make any sense. They're slain for Jesus Christ and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. No, people are going to get slain for this book. Why? I mean, how many people would die for this Bible right now? Well, I would. I know my wife would. You know, a lot of you would. But the average person isn't going to die for this book. But guess what becomes the hottest commodity on the earth during the time of Jacob's trouble? Hello. What's going to happen next? Turn to the book of Revelation. This thing's going to be it. And when the rapture happens, people are going to see what book was truly the real book. It's going to be a lot of people left behind that were using the new versions and that refused to use the King James Bible, that hated the King James Bible. It's going to be a lot of people. And all of a sudden, all us crazy King James only people you're going to realize that we were the ones that were saved if you're a new version user out there. Hmm. And all of a sudden, you're going to find your attitude has changed 180 degrees. And now you're no longer saying, those people are nuts, those people are crazy. You're saying, I know that this is the Word of God. I know that this book is true. Those people were preaching it. He said, rapture. They went up. I... This is it. This, is, this has been proven. And now we're going into the time of Jacob's trouble, just like they said was going to happen. And the book of Revelation, right there, that guy, he's not the you know Jesus Christ. He's the Antichrist. Look at him. He has a crown. He has a bow. He's conquering and things like this, you know. Uh, who, who does the, the sign of the bowman? 
the papal blessing. The Antichrist is going to sit in the seat of the Pope. Absolutely. The Antichrist is not the papal system like Reformed theology teaches. Reformed theology is Catholicism light, you know. It's kind of like Bud Light, you know, rather than Bud Beer or whatever. Reformed theology is nonsense. But they teach that the, the system, you know, the seat of the Antichrist is papal Rome. That's nonsense. The Antichrist, well, I shouldn't say the seat. The Antichrist, they say he's not a man. It's the papal system. No, 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 no. The whole world is going to worship him, all right? And he is going to sit on a throne. How do you have a papal system sitting on a throne? It's talking about a man. He's wounded in the right eye. Don't fall for Reformed theology either. But um, I just find it interesting that the Word of God, people are dying for the Word of God in the future, and yet the Alexandrian perverts, people like James White and others like that, they'll say that the Word of God does not exist in a perfect form on the earth today, unless it's in the manuscript somewhere just kind of hidden and we have to continually update it, and as we find more, then we can update it and stuff like that. Who's going to die for Greek? Okay? I mean, the Nestle's text. Who on earth is going to die for the Nestle's text? I mean, if you're saved, how much have you really learned from the Greek or the Hebrew? You learn things from the book, the King James Bible. Crazy. But let's continue here. I've got to turn the pages in my notes. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13, verse 18 through 23. This uh, passage here, I'm going to be doing a study on this in the future. And um, this thing defines everybody on the earth. Matthew chapter 13, verse 18 through 23. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When any one heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. You see a little video, preaching video on YouTube, and you just oh, you know, you click on it. Oh, whatever, that's nuts. I'm going to go back to watching whatever. Verse 20. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it, yet doeth he not, or, or yet, excuse me, yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. The false convert. You hear this, you know, I was raised as a Christian, now I'm an atheist. Well, there you go. Verses 20 and 21. Verse 22. He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. Sort of a lukewarm Laodicean professing Christian. Verse 23. But he that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some an hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Don't be worried because you haven't produced all kinds of fruit and you say, oh, I haven't really you know, had a chance to witness or I haven't really whatever for the Lord in a while. As long as you've produced some fruit in your life, as long as you've done something for the Lord, you'll see fruit there if you're tru truly saved. All right, And again, these are the people in the time of Jacob's trouble, Revelation chapter 6 there, that we read, verse 9, those are the people, those are the fruit-bearing saved people at that point in time. They're the ones that are going to be willing to die for the Word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. John chapter 17. See another verse on this. God's word is so important. That's why I get very, very suspicious when I start to see people putting down this book and saying, I, you know, that's really it's not that important and things. Yes, it is. John chapter 17, verse 14. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them. They're going to be put to death in the future because of it. Because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. 
I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. This is before the uh, you know, rapture is really revealed to the Apostle Paul. Um, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Of course, it's not talking either, by the way. Let me just preface this because I know that people are going to say, oh, well, what about this? What about that? I've already talked about this in other studies, but let me just cover it here again. What's, Jesus is not talking about that you'll never leave and that you're going to be here on the earth always and things like this. There is no resurrection. There's no going to heaven when you die. That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is when you get saved, you aren't instantly just, you leave. Okay? That's what he's talking about. All right? You will stay. The Lord will keep you here on the earth. That's why Paul earlier in Philippians talked about he's in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. That's what he's saying here. Compare Scripture with Scripture. All right? Again, you know, posties, posty toasties, little people that teach that you go through the tribulation, as they call it, they'll try to use that verse there, verse 15, John 17, 15, to say that the Lord's not going to take anybody up. Uh, that's ridiculous. It's not what's going on there. But uh, let's get back to the Scripture here. John 17, verse 16 they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. You know the best way to judge somebody, to see if they're truly saved? What is their attitude towards the truth? I'm not going to look at somebody and say, I smell cigarettes on them, you know, or look at them and they're, they're, what's that? Isn't that alcohol over there? Or you got, you know, whatever else. I'm not going to do a whole lot of that. I'm going to look at that person. I'm going to say, what do you think about the King James Bible? What do you think about the rapture? What do you think about dispensational truth? What do you think about any subject? Truth. And I've seen Christians that are carnal Christians and they just, they are there, oh brother, I'm really having a hard time. I'm struggling with pornography addiction and I'm and I'm, I'm my weight is way out of whack and I'm having trouble with gluttony and I uh, and stay. Well, what about uh, you know, did did you ever see this thing here proving dispensation? And they go, Oh yeah, brother, I saw that. Isn't that amazing? And I will just get it so excited over the truth. And they're just like, you know, what do you think about this? And they, they want to talk about the Bible. See? That person is saved. But you get these people, well, I've cleaned up my life, and I've done this, and I've done that, and I've, I've done so many good things. And you say, what do you think about dispensational teaching? Well, I would personally have to disagree with that. And, and uh, I believe that the whole Bible is for me. And I, you know, I respect the fact that you disagree with that. And I agree that to disagree, and, and we'll disagree to agree to agree to disagree. You know, and, 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 you know, and, and we're just going to I, I just, I don't want to argue, okay? Let's not argue doctrine. Okay. I look at somebody like that, and you know, and they might not know. You know, I realize there's ignorance there. Sure, absolutely. But you talk to them about more and more truth, and they start to get offended, and they start to act like a lost person. You know why? Because they are a lost person. The test, the standard to see if somebody's saved or not is, what is their attitude towards the truth? The Lord, when He saves you, He will sanctify you with the truth. The Word of God. And the attitude of somebody towards this book is going to determine whether or not they're saved. Okay? Simple. Back to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6, I'm going to go verses 10 through 11. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, unto their fellow servants also and their brethren, that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. Oh. <sighs> Why on earth would God allow a thing like that? I mean, why, God, why doesn't God just stop the suffering? Why doesn't He stop the martyrdom? 
Why hasn't God stopped the Catholic Church from doing what they're doing? Why? Let's go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, I don't know how bad things are going to get before we get called up to be with the Lord. I really have no idea. It's something I've struggled with ever since I've been saved and, and really understood the issues that you know, we face in our world. Um, things are getting worse all the time. And I realize we're here. We're hindering things. We're letting you know, the spirit of Antichrist and things um, which means hindering. And uh, I understand that. I understand. But uh, I've studied church history. And I know the kind of things that Catholicism has done to Bible-believing Christians. And um, if you've never studied Fox's Book of Martyrs or Martyr's Mirror or some of the other things, uh, the history of the Waldensian people, uh, it's the kind of stuff that will make you lose sleep. I mean, it's, it's stuff that you just cannot fathom people being that evil. The levels of torture that they subjected Christians to. Um, you know, I mean, even in the 20th century, the Vatican Holocaust by Everett Manhattan, talking about over in Yugoslavia, the, the Catholic Ustashi, what they did to the, the um, Serbian, the Orthodox, Greek Orthodox people. Uh, just, just stuff you can't fathom. You know, just terrible. But you know what? God has reasons for all of this stuff. And our attitude as Christians should not be to question that and say, God, I don't understand. I, I'm starting to doubt you because of this stuff. God has reasons for everything. You know, it's interesting here in Romans chapter 8 that we just read there, you know, we're counted as sheep for the slaughter. We're, we're conquerors, you know, through the love of God and everything else. Verse 28 in Romans 8 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. If we have to die as martyrs, if you die as a martyr, if you get tortured to death for Jesus Christ, it's going to work together for good. The Bible says that you'll receive a crown. One of the crowns that's given at the judgment seat of Christ is for martyrs those that die in the, in the cause of Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean that you do a Muslim thing, you know, and you go and strap bombs to yourself and run in and blow people up or something. No, you're not supposed to do that as a Christian. But people are getting more and more and more wicked, more hateful towards Bible-believing Christians. Look at the comments on this channel if you need to see some scientific proof of that. And they want to kill us. It's getting to that point where the diversity and tolerance is going to go away and they're going to start saying, you know, Hey, you're dangerous. We need to do something to correct you, to re-educate you. It's getting there. We're heading in that direction. Donald Trump, the Jesuit, is putting Jesuit trained president that we have here in America now. He's putting other Jesuits into key positions, as I showed in just a video the other day. You know, the head of Homeland Security, a Jesuit Georgetown University trained uh, Marine, you know, general, uh, retired. Um, they're putting people, they're, they're putting their players in a position. We could see very horrible persecution. Uh, and there's different schools of thought on that. You know, how much could we see? When's the rapture going to happen? Again, I don't know. But the point is, it is not our place to ask, why are you allowing this stuff to happen, Lord? Our place is to say, we're conquerors. If they put a bullet through my head and then come in and kill my wife and kill my son, Okay, I get to come back. 
and rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. And if any of those goonie birds that would do that, the death squads and whatever else, or ISIS or some Jesuits or whatever other little order that they have, if any of these people come and murder myself and my family, um, if that happens and they survive the time of Jacob's trouble, I'm coming back with the Lord and we're going to be taking you to judgment. Am I more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ? Yeah. What about the saints in Revelation chapter 6? Yeah. And again, you know, if you're a postie, you're probably going, here are the saints. Why are there saints under the altar? Well, you better ask yourself the other question. Why are there saints before the first seal is opened? Before one of the seals there in Revelation chapter 6. Why are there 24 elders redeemed by the blood of the Lamb? Out of every people, kindred, tongue, and nation. Why are they there? And a great multitude. Hmm? And they say, what about the saints that are that under the altar? They're people that die in the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? They're not Christians. They're not by the body of Christ. The body of Christ leaves before the Antichrist is unleashed. But they're saints. You can be a saint. There's Old Testament saints. They weren't in Christ. You have the, the body of Christ the Christians from the church age, and then in the time of Jacob's trouble, you have saints. Time of Jacob's trouble, saints. All right, you can read about that in Revelation chapter 7, which we'll be covering in the next study. But let's get back to it here. Verse 12. Okay, it says, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. All right. Now, keep your hand there and go back to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24, the infamous Matthew chapter 24, that all posties hang themselves with this chapter, trying to prove desperately that the body of Christ uh, goes into this time is really kind of funny. I mean, the body of Christ experiencing the judgment and wrath of Jesus Christ. Sadomasochistic, apparently. Uh, no, it's called false doctrine, the post he's have there. But let's look here. Matthew chapter 24, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now learn a parable of the fig tree, when his branch is yet tender, and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors." Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Okay, now I read all those verses for a reason. We're going to see some tie-ins here. Very, very interesting tie-ins. Turn back to Revelation chapter 6. Let's read verse 13. Again, verse 12, you saw it there. You have, uh, there's a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair. Uh you have to. Okay, I'll get back to that earthquake thing in just a minute here. I forgot to, to make a mention of that, but I want to make another point here quickly. Um, but you see there in verse 12, the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Verse 13, compare that to Matthew chapter 24. Verse 13, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Hmm, how about that? Matthew chapter 24, uh, it says there, The stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. The figs fall from heaven because they're shaken. What are figs? The fig tree in the King James Bible is symbolic of Israel. Now, this is very interesting because I believe that in the time or when we go to be with the Lord, we become as the angels of God in the resurrection. They are as the angels of God in heaven. Um, angels are not winged, you know, men 
or especially not winged men and women. Um, angels are regular looking men. But I believe when we go to be to be with the Lord up in the resurrection, I believe that we become conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. What is Jesus Christ? He's Jewish. When he came to the earth, he was Jewish. So we're going to look like Jesus Christ. We will be Jewish men. What are the figs? Like in the Jews. The fig tree, Israel. The figs from the fig tree are the Jews. Very interesting. And again, you know, I could do a whole study just on this one thing. But I want to show you something else there. It's very interesting before I... I have a bunch of other scriptures we're going to be looking at here just to show you some of this stuff. Uh, the thing of the great earthquake. Okay, um, Revelation chapter 6, verse 12. There was a great earthquake. Okay, keep your hand there in Revelation chapter 6 and go back to... Um, No, where's that? Revelation chapter 16 and verse 20. Actually, we'll go up to verse 18. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. Keep that one in mind. Okay? So you see a great earthquake there. Again, see that the, the books of, the, of Revelation there, the, excuse me, the chapters of Revelation are not chronological. And again, I'm not going to get into a whole lot of this stuff because it, it takes this whole study in a different direction. But you see there in Revelation chapter 6 that there's a great earthquake, verse 12, but yet over here in chapter 16 there's a great earthquake. It's the same event. You say, well, it can't be. It comes after that. It's retelling what's going on, but in greater detail. Revelation chapter 6, verse 12, says there was a great earthquake. Semicolon. Over here you have verse 18 down through verse 20, describing this earthquake. It gives more detail about the same event. You see how that thing works? Show you something else here. Um, Jude, the book of Jude. And because I've seen this in the comments, people say, you know, Brian teaches that, that, you know, in the resurrection, Christians become angels. And what a dumb heresy is that? You know, ha, ha, ha. Well, I'm not talking angels in the sense of Hollywood angels, you know, the, or the uh, what's the family circus or whatever, you know, the, the grandfather's up in heaven and he's got wings on or something like this. No, 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 no. And he still looks like an old man. Kind of odd. So you get, you know, whatever stage you die in, that's what you get when you go to heaven. You're like that forever. You know, don't think so. Um, that's Roman Catholic. A comic strip there. Jude... There's only one chapter, so but uh, look at verse 14. Now remember, before we read this, Matthew chapter 24 said that the angels, he's, the Lord's going to blow a trumpet, and the angels are going to go out, and they're going to gather together his elect. Okay, The angels come back with Jesus Christ. But look here in Jude uh, chapter 1, verse 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. I thought he was coming back with angels. No, it says here, saints. Well, then it must be a contradiction. No, it's not a contradiction. Saints are the angels that come back with Jesus Christ. We become angels. That's why there's a great multitude of angels after the 24 elders are described in Revelation chapter 5. Verse 15, there in Jude, to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. We're going to come back and go out and gather the nations and bring them to judgment. We're going to see that in just a little bit here too. But I'm just going to show you the other 
passage here, 1 John chapter 3, because I know that there's people saying, you said that we're going to look like Jesus and we're going to be Jewish men, you know, and things for, you know, in eternity. That's our incorruptible body, you know, Jewish men. This is ridiculous. Let's read. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 through 3 says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Reference to angels. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is, and every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. In the resurrection we become angels. These angels that we become will look like Jesus Christ. We shall be like him. All right? It's there. So, let's get back to the study. Because like I said, I've, you know, I've covered this and other things. You know, the thing of angels, what are they? You can look that up on one of the videos I did years and years ago. Um, getting into a lot more detail about what are angels. What they are and what they aren't. I should say it that way. But let's continue. Revelation chapter 6, verse 14 and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. What did we read in Revelation chapter 16? The mountains and the islands were not found. There's going to come a huge earthquake, and it's just going to make the mountains go like that down, and the oceans are going to go rip up like this. There won't be any more islands. Huge landmass. There'll be some ponds and some lakes and things and rivers and whatnot, I'm sure. But uh, there's going to be a lot more land in the Millennial Kingdom. Why would that be? Well, probably because the Lord understands that uh, when people live to be a thousand years old, which they'll be doing in the Millennial Kingdom, the Bible says a child shall die at a hundred years old. In other words, if somebody dies at a hundred, they'll say, oh, it's just a child. You know, the Lord's going to restore things back to the way that they would have been in the Garden of Eden or I should say maybe before the flood. But the point is, you have people living that whole time, you're going to need a lot more land to sustain people. And there's going to be no problem at all. You, know, you won't get to the end of the Millennial Kingdom and lords are going to be going, oh, what are we going to do? It's, you know, we're facing overpopulation or something. You know, We need to be sustainable. <laughs> no, 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 no. The Lord is going to rule things perfectly here for the Millennial Kingdom. And you're not going to have Satan messing around with people on the earth. He's going to be bound for the thousand years in the bottomless pit, which will be wonderful. But uh, again, Revelation chapter 16, verse 20, this great earthquake that flattens everything, it's mentioned right here in verse 13. Excuse me, verse 14. Excuse me. So how could the books be chronological? Chapter 6 happens, and then, you know, 10 chapters later, there's another earthquake. Every mountain and island were moved out of their places. What, they're moved first and then they're flattened or something? You know, 10 chapters later, years and years later? No, no. And of course, if you read Revelation chapter 7, which we'll be getting into in next week, or maybe whenever it comes out, um, verse 3 says, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God on their foreheads. So the earth gets wiped out. All the mountains and islands and things are moved out of their places, and the Lord says, hey, don't hurt the earth, in chapter 7. No, the books of Revelation are, I keep saying books, the chapters of Revelation are not chronological. Remember that. But let's continue here. Let's finish up. Matthew chapter 15, or, uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses 15 through 17. I say books when I mean chapters. I say, you know, or uh, chapter 15 when I mean verse 15. Here we go. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? Okay. I want you to notice three things. Number one, the survivors 
of the time of Jacob's trouble, because this has taken place at the end. Revelation chapter 6, verse 1 is the beginning of the time of Jacob's trouble. Seven years later, we're hitting verses 15 through 17. It's telling the whole time start to finish. Revelation chapter 6 is the whole time of Jacob's trouble. The people at the end, those who have survived, are where? Underground. Did you know that there's a lot of people right now, especially rich people, that are building homes underground? Oh, yeah. They're for sale. People are buying up all the missile silos that were built back during the Cold War era out in the Midwest and things like this and some other places. People are buying these missile silos and they're fixing them up. Why? Because they know bad times are coming. They want to be underground. Isn't that something? How about the dumbs? You say, huh? Deep underground military bases. They're all over the country. They're all over the world. You wouldn't believe some of these facilities and things like this. They're building underground facilities everywhere. There's lots and lots and lots of them. How interesting. Second thing I want you to notice is there, it says in verse 16, Hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. Hmm. Well, how does that work? Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 and 32. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. See, we come back with the Lord. Jude says saints. Here again we read angels. And what does He do? He uh, Then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. Hide us from the wrath of the Lamb that sits on His throne. Hmm. Verse 32, And before Him shall be gathered all nations, and He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And these survivors that are underground are saying, Hide us from Him that sits on the throne, for his, the great day of His wrath is coming. Who shall be able to what? Stand. Our job when we come back with Jesus Christ is going to be going out and getting these people from the deep underground military bases, from the underground homes, the survivalists, the preppers, the whoevers that make it through. We're going to be getting them and saying, come with me, please. You have an appointment in Jerusalem. Who shall be able to stand? None of them. None of them are going to be able to say, okay, Jesus, you know, I didn't want to tell you this. I'm a member of the Illuminati. I'm one of the 13 bloodlines. I have $12 billion. It's in gold coins. You let me off. You let me into the millennial kingdom. I'll make sure to tell you where it's stashed. <laughs> I don't think so. Jesus, I want to tell you, I'm actually, I'm one of the uh, provincials. I'm a fourth Val Jesuit. <laughs> Get in line guy here made it through somehow he's a just a soldier and just ran through the mountains you know the whole seven years or whatever else never took the mark and whatever and things like this he's here for judgment and here's this guy here powerful whatever high up ruling elite you know bankster international bankster or whatever they're the same lord looks at him as the same judges him the same way and we get to go out and hunt him down and it isn't going to be like, where are they at? I wonder. We're going to have the mind of Christ. And we're going to be going right down into them things, those underground military bases. And we're going to be saying, come with us. Time for judgment. They're going to be down there hiding. Oh, you know, please fall on us. You know, close the, close the bay door and oh, close all the stuff. Again, if you're a goon, what are you doing? Get saved. You're not going to make it. You're seeing all this stuff come to pass. You know, I saw this interview the one time this guy's raised in black ops and he said, they, he 
I forget how it came up or whatever, but he's, he's like, yeah, he's like uh, the, the one group that, you know, is really something and have a lot of power and whatever else is people that believe the King James Bible. And at the time I'm watching, I'm like, huh, what did he just say? I mean, the guy's black ops and he's going, yeah, people with the King James Bible, they read the King James Bible. Guy was raised in deep underground military bases in the covert black op world. According to what he was saying, maybe he was just nuts or something, but he said he was raised in this stuff and he's like, yeah, people use the King James Bible, yeah, yeah, you know. They know it's coming to pass. Very interesting. Finally, let's turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. What hope is there for a lost person? First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8 through 11. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. That's us if we're saved. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Eternal salvation begins when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, when you come to Him in a repentant, broken, contrite spirit, and it ends when He says, come up hither. That's the redemption of the purchased possession. That's why Paul wrote, and he said, now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Interesting. Verse 10, Who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. That's our job, brethren. Our job is to be here. I have a, de a desire more and more to depart and to be with Christ. But you know what? I know that you out there need to be encouraged. I need to be encouraged from you. Don't think it's all just uh, one-sided here, you know, and, and you just sit there and you encourage and let me encourage you. You encourage me. And I appreciate those of you who send letters and, and thank you notes and whatever else. I appreciate you. I appreciate you very much. I appreciate those of you who believe in the ministry and, and support this ministry. Thank you. We need each other. And that day is going to come when we will have our rest, when we will have our perfect bodies that we don't have to worry about health and we don't have to worry about anything else and making money and paying bills and over. And we're with the Lord. But if you're saved, uh, you don't have this hope. God is not your friend. You've got some rough times ahead of you. I suggest you get saved today. Don't put it off another day. Truly saved. I'm not talking about come to church and help pay off the mortgage and whatever. No, 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 no. I'm talking about you coming in faith, putting your faith in Jesus Christ, His finished work on the cross. So... Uh, that's going to be it for this study. Um, normally I close with a word of prayer, but uh, i got to end this thing um, because there's some... I uh, need to end it here because i got uh, something I need to get done here pretty quickly, but um, we'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much for watching. Um, really, really busy right now. I have a lot going on, so please do keep us in your prayers, and uh, we will see you in the next study.